Hey y'all, I'm James Wright and welcome to the shop. Today we are working on the box and we are going to be doing some resawing. That's where we take the board and we go, hi -ya! and we split the one board into two. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, yes, so uh, this, is one of these pr this is one of these steps that I, I absolutely enjoy. Once you actually understand resawing and um, you, you, you see what all goes into it, it is, it's something that can be surprisingly enjoyable because it is so much work. Um, and maybe that's just because I'm twisted, but uh, why are you laughing at me, babe? Because that's the only way you do things. But like resawing is one of these fun things, because anytime, anytime I show a picture of a saw going through the board this way, I always get comments of, wow, that's a lot of work. It's like, well, yeah, but it's still a lot of fun. <laughs> so we'll be talking about a bunch of different ways of doing that. Um, a couple updates of things coming up. Um, Let's see, I'm going to, uh, oh yeah, I'm gonna be down at the Peach Meet this uh, Friday and Saturday. So this is down in Georgia, just outside of Atlanta. Um, so if any of you are near um, Atlanta, we're going to be at Madison, Georgia. Um, and you have to be a member of the MWTCA to be there, but to give you an idea what's gonna happen on Friday morning, there's going to be a sale outside, weather permitting, or even if it's raining, they'll have tents out for it. Um, and it is, imagine a, a decent sized parking lot where everyone has a truck full of old tools and they open up the back and they sell off what they want, uh, what they don't want. Um, and the outside sale is a lot of the cheaper things, uh, the, the things that are uh, they need a little bit more restoration or the bigger things that people don't want to lug inside. Um, and it's usually the better deals happen Friday morning for sales. Um, but then on Saturday we go inside and it's about the size of a, a, a tight basketball court, so the actual basketball court size. Um, but it's completely covered with tools um, and they're all for sale. It is absolutely glorious. Um, and there's also a, a cool tool talk where they talk about the history of a particular tool or maker um, with bringing a lot of the background to it. And it is an incredibly fun time. But in the, in the south of the US, this is the biggest tool sale of the entire year. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to coming down there next week for this. Um, yeah, also I, uh, I just heard that I'm going to be doing a talk at the National MWTCA meet in Green Bay, Wisconsin. This is in June. Um, so I'm going to be there as well, and I'm hopefully going to be having a new bench that I can take up there and show off. So that should be exciting. Um, I think those are all the things that are coming up right now. Am I missing anything? I don't think so. So we're going to have a little bit of fun here tonight. So uh, let's actually look at what we need to do here. We have the, the box that we created the last two times. We cut the sides, we've cut the dovetails on the ends, and now we need to make a bottom for it because it really just doesn't hold tools very well at the moment. There's just something that, uh, yeah. Okay, I should stop that joke. It's not going anywhere. <laughs> I wasn't so, paying attention, so if you were making fun of me, you would have... No, I wasn't that. making fun of you. I was trying to make a, a joke about uh, uh, the bottom that's missing. If the bottom fell out, you know, never mind. Um, so what we're going to do is we have a we have the scrap left over from our sides, and this is a little longer than two foot long with the angle cut on it, and we're going to resaw this in half so we make two pieces. Now this is three quarter inch wide, and we're going to take a a kerf out of the middle that's about a sixteenth ish wide, and so that means we're going to have two pieces that are around three eighths of an inch, slightly less than that ish wide. Now what we could do is we could make that groove big enough to fit in there, or we can keep it this thickness and add that rigidity to the bottom, or put grooving into it, and then we can pillow out the sides to make them fit into the groove, which is what we're going to be doing here. So can I ask a question? What's that? Why are you doing that versus just one piece? Um, because I would have to get a big enough piece. This is, what, seven inches across? Yeah, seven inches plus the groove, so it's going to be about seven and a half inches that the board needs to be across. Well, I'm making it out of this piece because we already had it for these, but this isn't wide enough to cover the whole bottom. So if we resaw it, we can get two boards, put them side by side, attach them together, and now we have a board that's big enough for the bottom. Um, but the big reason why I'm doing this is a lot of people are terrified of resawing. It's just one of those steps that you look at and you're like, oh, I gotta resaw. This is, it's something you put off until the very end. And so today I wanna show you the methods to how to resaw so this becomes something you don't have to worry about. And I'm just gonna be using a simple handsaw. I'm not gonna be using my big frame saw. The frame saw makes it a little bit easier and a little bit of fun. But today we're just gonna be using a handsaw. I'll be talking about this a little bit more in a little bit here. So if you are worried about resawing, don't be. 
Uh, the first time, you know, it, it takes a little bit of getting used to. But once you understand it and you see some of the tricks to it, it becomes one of these aha moments and everything opens up. Resawing is one of these, these key skills. Once you get that under your belt, there are so many different possibilities in the shop. So this is why I really wanted to have this in here because this is a key skill. We're, we're not really building a tool tote here. We are building a series of skills to make the tool tote. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why I picked some of the joinery and methods for this. So the first thing we need to do is figure out how long to cut this board. Um, and what that is, is it needs to go from side to side plus fit into the grooves. Now, wood does not expand and contract lengthwise. So we don't have to worry about that. We can make this a full length piece. So what we can do is, let me switch over to this and show you a little closer the measurement here. Oh, come on, why are you not going up? Oh, because it's jammed, that's why. I'll try not to unplug it like that. Okay, uh, two, there we go. So what we're gonna do here is measure out this box. So the first measurement, and a lot of people are really worried about how do you get the measurement inside the groove. Turn you over here. Let me see that, yeah. How do you get the measurement inside the groove? And you can get these little sticks that extend out and touch either side and you pull it out. You look at it and you get your measurement off of that. But what I do is I grab my tape measure. <gasps> I know a tape measure here. And I measure from side to side. And inside here to inside here is 22 and a half. And I know I cut these grooves a half inch deep, a quarter inch deep. So a quarter inch plus a quarter inch is a half inch. So 22 and a half plus a half, we're at 23 inches. So we want to cut this board at 23 inches. Now if I cut it precisely at 23 inches, there's a chance that it's gonna bind up in that groove. It's slightly long. Um, and so I'm actually gonna back it off about an eighth inch. So I'm gonna cut it at 22 and 7 eighths of an inch um, long. And that way I have an eighth inch of play end to end. That eighth inch of play is not for expansion and contraction. It's just there in case I make a mistake. Um, so we're going to cut this uh, well, excuse me, that, that'll be the final size, is the, the uh, 22 and 7 eighths. Uh, we're going to actually keep that eighth inch on there so that we have a little bit of play in the board because we want to have the chance to cut this down to the length and we can trim it down. So we're going to cut this at 23 inches and then later we're going to bring it down to the 22 and an eighth. So let's make some marks. Any questions while I'm sitting doing this? No, Alan did what he called a drive-by funding. So he said how to Chocolate help. friend added. He said, drive by fun and give a good mom joke, Sarah, and I'll check back after the Bible study. And so <laughs> I typed my mom joke so he could see it, but I said, so you can hear it. I said, the invention of the shovel was groundbreaking, but the invention of the broom swept the nation. <laughs> <laughs> nice. But they're saying and that... Some people are having stream issues in and out. I, I don't notice it on our end, so I don't know if people Yeah, are unfortunately, having... that is not something we can fix. Streaming is all about the uh, speed of connection, both your end and our end, which our end is usually pretty good. I pay serious money to make sure it's good. I thought good, you were going to say it was all about the base for a second. It's all about what? The base. It is all about the base. <laughs> no tenor. So we're going to mark all the way around this board, and we're going to cut it off at this length. And so this is cut. This mark is precisely the same length as inside of that groove to groove. Um, and I'm leaving it full length so that we can trim it back just a little bit to give ourselves some wiggle room in here. I really need to reattach this leather. This is driving me bonkers here now. Now. I could bring out my, my uh, bench hook, but as is for me, I have gotten to the point where I like cutting here on the end. So I'll grab the saw. This is a carcass saw, a cross cut tooth, medium sized back saw. Start on the far side of the board and then cut back along the line. an established cut all the way across and I'm going to view my corner here so I go from opposite corner to opposite corner Oops. went a 
little off course, but not too bad. And in this case, it really doesn't matter. The only important thing is that it's square this way. So when we join them back together, we have a nice square flat edge. So I flip it over, do the same thing on this side, and then connect opposite corner to opposite corner. Correcting my cut a little bit. There we go. And we want to check it and make sure that we are square. And we should be because we drew the line off there. Oh, look at that. We're square. Happiness. <laughs> now we need to resaw this down. You may have noticed that I've actually done some of the resawing already um, just because I don't want to take up all of our time on just watching me resaw over and over again. When I make the mark in the middle of this board, what I do is I set the marking gauge off center. Um, let me zoom in a little bit so you can see what I'm talking about here. Focus. There we go. You can see how these lines aren't exactly center. And I'll set the marking gauge point so it's a little off center. And then I can take it around from the other side and I can do the other line. And what basically I'm doing is I'm cutting, I'm making the groove of where the saw will go. That saw will go in between these two lines. So when I'm down here in the end, we can mark one line this side. And then I can turn around. I don't know if you guys can see this line. Not really. And we mark the other line on this side. Really clear on your button. Not so clear on the one. Back it up. Yeah. Probably just on the top is where you'll be able to see it. So it'll end up looking like that. So we can saw down the edge. So I set this up. Any questions so far? No. Come on. Whoa. Where did my other, did I turn this thing off? What's that? Oh. Oh, did you pull that cord? You I pulled, pulled that cord out. Okay. Well, I oh, guess we won't be recording questions tonight. Oh. Oh, ye of little faith in my ability. <laughs> So um, I have this in my end vise here. Um, some people actually like to put it in the leg vise, um, but because I'm pushing along the bench, I actually like to have it in the, in the, the end vise here. Um, personal preference, just depending upon what you like. Um, I know a lot of people like having it in that, but I like being on the end of the, the vise. Um, next thing I'm gonna do is I have a handsaw. Uh, this is a five points per inch um, handsaw, which has a rip tooth. Um, and I sharpened this one just today because whenever I'm going to be doing a bunch of resawing, I take the time to stop and sharpen the saw. Uh, it makes a big difference on how fast you can cut when you have a sharp saw. Surprising, I know, um, one of these revolutionary things. Um, but most of the time when I'm resawing, it's rare that I'm going to be resawing one board. I'm usually resawing re several uh, drawer bottoms or panel inserts. Um, and so because of that, I'm usually going to be spending quite a bit of time resawing. And so it's worth it to go and sharpen, excuse me, re worth it to go and sharpen the saw. Now, most of the time I'm going to be using my big frame saw, which I have a couple videos on making that if you want to see that. Um, it just makes it a little bit easier because you're using your full body to move it as opposed to just the arm that's holding it. But I'm going to show you a couple different techniques um, so you can make it a little bit easier on yourself. But with big teeth like a four or five points per inch, it goes pretty quickly. So um, first thing I want to do, so I'm actually going to raise this up a little bit more, uh -oh. is we are going to... What did I do? Hang on. What? Do you need me? Uh, something disappeared. Where did that go? Do you want me to come check it? Yes. <laughs> We're having technical issues. I'll be right back. <laughs> Making sure that we're still alive. That's what I'm wondering if I somehow made it. Uh-oh. I think I made it go away. Okay. Uh, we're still alive as long as you didn't okay. click the out button. I don't think I did. Um, I want to go to this one. <laughs> Hang with us, folks. <laughs> we got to bring the control room back up so we can do these. Live videos. Still live. Okay, good. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, control room. 
And making sure. Yep, there we go. Okay, we're back. So let's actually start sawing this. Now, if you saw the cut I did earlier, which one am I on? I'm on that camera. Let's move over this one. I'm going to do basically the exact same thing. It's just rather than it being a wide board, we're going to do it across the top. I'm going to back up a little bit and let you see this. I'm going to hold the saw loosely, just like normal. I'm going to let it rest between this front finger and back in here. Pointer finger forward on here. And some people like to start with the little teeth up here. Um, I find that just hard because my control is so far away from it. The saw just is a bit flimsy in between there. I like to start it back here on the big teeth. I'm going to pinch the board just like before, let it slide along my thumb. You may have heard me say this a few times, but Ooh, lift it up a little bit. Ooh, freshly sharpened teeth. They catch everything now. I have an issue here. Lifting the weight up. Bring it back along the board. What am I catching on? There we go. And there, we've established the cut all the way across the top of the board. So just like we did when we cross cut the board, now we're going to be ripping down on that line. Now, what I want to do is I'm going to not cut deep on this end. I'm going to keep cutting deep on this end. And I want the saw to go from this angle and pivot down to something around this way. And that way I'm not cutting on the lines I can't see. I'm only cutting on the lines I can see. Establish the cut a little bit better. And then go to town. And all I'm doing is watching the line on my side here, making sure I follow it down. I'm not worrying about this line over here because my teeth are just being caught in that track I was in earlier. And the whole time I'm actually going to be bending at my knees and I'm going to be lowering myself down, keeping the saw in line. Okay, so now we've cut an angle across here. And now what I want to do is I'm going to take the saw out, loosen the vise, flip the board around, and now I can oh. cut on this side of the line. So I'm just tracking on this side here. What's wrong? Oh, they said I missed some questions, which is possible because that probably was when it went blank. <laughs> so now I can cut on this side, but because I have this angle here, I can now cut all the way down to something like this on this side. And so I'm just going to keep going back and forth from one side to the other. It's a little hard because we got that spike right at the top. And one of the problems uh, with hand saw, with resawing by hand, is people are trying to push the saw. And you'll see someone getting in it and trying to get their shoulder up on the saw. And they'll be up here just pushing down on it. You don't want to do that. You want to let the weight of the saw do it. If more than the weight of the saw is pushing into the wood, it's going to jam. You just want to let the weight of the saw do it. Get your body out of the way. Get your body back. And just let the saw do it. What you're going to, well, I'll talk about that in a minute once I get it up. The more you can let the saw do the work, the longer you can do the cutting and the easier it is. So if I start to get tired, let me do this for a moment. So if I start to get tired of this hand, what I can do is I can switch over here. Oh, I have a whole other hand I can use for a while. 
And this is a great opportunity to learn to teach your other hand because it's already held in this track. So it's going to go fairly well. You just can teach your hand, your other hand, to do the sawing. I think I have one tooth somewhere right here that is a little bit taller. So I find myself catching right there. And I think I have one tooth that's sticking down a little bit too far. Ooh, and there we go. Now, you may ask, how long is it gonna take you to resaw this whole board? And I did from here to here in about seven minutes. And so this was, what, four or five minutes here live doing the talking. So most of the time a board about this size is gonna be about 10 minutes worth of work. But if you notice, I haven't opened it up yet. I don't know what the inside of this looks like. And this is the big question for a lot of people resawing. Well. So I thought I'd do this live. Let's see. What does the inside of this look like? I'll take that. That's pretty darn pretty. A few passes of the saw, that'll clean up nice and flat. One of the problems you often have is that it'll be scooped out on one side and the other side will be bowed out. And that's because in the cut, the saw will start bending. And you'll be on the line on this side and you'll be on the line on this side but inside the, cut, the cut, inside the cut, the saw has bent and you'll be getting this scooped out surface. And the reason that happens is because someone is pushing the saw into the work. The more you let the saw do the work, the straighter your cut will be. If you find yourself pushing the saw, you're gonna open this up and find that one side is curved out. And so that's, that's the most common problem that people have is that they're trying to force the saw to do the work. Let the weight of the saw do the work. You just provide the in and out motion to it, and it will cut a nice true track as long as it was sharpened well. Speaking of which, I need to check that. Ah, look at that. I've got one tooth right around here that is out of set. It's leaning over. There's Must have gotten braces. hit somewhere. I wonder if I was hit it earlier moving around. And so what that was doing, is I'm cutting fine through here, but once I get to this point, we like jam. And it's causing the saw to bounce a bit, so I've got to reset that. But yeah, it's time for something else. So, we've got ourselves two boards resawed out to make a bottom. This is heavy. Um, yeah, I'm just, I love resawing. It is so much fun. Now, the next thing we need to do is we need to talk about joining these two boards together. Now, because they're about three-eighths of an inch thick, really, for a tote like this, there is no reason for us to actually glue them together. Um, they could just float in there and be perfectly fine. I know a lot of people say, ooh, well, what if they warp one way or the other? Oh, well, it's a tool tote, um, and the amount that they could possibly move is, is not going to be that much. Even if you pile in several planes, the amount of force that's going to put is not going to be enough to, to twist them out of shape. The next thing you could do is if you had a 1 8 inch tongue and groove set, you could make an 8 inch tongue and groove that these two would fit together. Ooh, that would be nice. Uh, you could do a shiplap, um, and that's great. But in this case, what I want to do is actually just glue them together. <gasps> oh no. I'm going to be using glue in this glue project. Together. What's that? I thought you just said you weren't going to glue them together. Oh, I said you can. Oh. Um, but. <laughs> You know, I've thought about this back, back and forth one way or the other. A lot of people like say this should really be a no glue project. And what is the point of a no glue project? To say it's a no glue project. Pretty much. <laughs> um, is it really going to make any difference? No. Glue is quick and simple and easy. So I'm going to glue them together. I think um, you should create some funky dovetail. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking originally I'm going to do a shiplap. Um, and there's a bunch of different things about that, but it's just... One of the reasons why I do hand tool woodworking is I'm not a historical woodworker. Um, I'm not doing hand tool woodworking for precision. I'm not doing hand tool woodworking for making amazing things. I'm doing hand tool woodworking because I find it fun. And 
I don't have an eighth inch tongue and groove plane. I could do a ship lap on this relatively easily, but I'm gonna glue it together because I want to glue it together. <laughs> so um, start the arguments now. If you don't like that, well, you can build your own the way you want to make it, but we're building this one the way I want to make it. So the next thing we need to do is we need to get these two ready to join together. And in this case, because I cut them from a board and ahead of time I had flattened and smoothed these out, these are, are pretty darn close to come together. Um, I want to actually lay them out so that I have my pencil missing. Oh, there, put it over here. Just before I went live, I was working on something else here, and so I moved all the live stuff over there, and this came back. I'm going to put a carpenter's Where did, where did v. the questions go now? What's that? <sighs> Nothing. Are you having mental issues? Why do you assume they're mental? Um, I love you. Technical, yes. <laughs> My only mental issue is standing over there. So we're going to have <laughs> the, uh, the carpenter's V on here. There it is. Now let me know how I want these joined together. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take these two boards and we're gonna lift them up. We're gonna keep these two edges jointed together and we're gonna put them in the vise. And I'm going to tighten the vise down. I'm intending to re-glue the leather. You know, and when you've monst monstered, when you've mastered the toolbox, you can build the dog shed to go with <laughs> <laughs> This sounds like a smart idea. <laughs> I'm surprised you don't have a deluxe one yet. <laughs> <laughs> one with a, with a uh, jacuzzi suite. And... <laughs> okay, what I've done is I've set this up. These two tops are nice and flush. And I'm going to grab my smoothing plane. Yes, I'm going to joint with my smoothing plane. Um, what you're looking for is you need a plane that is about half the length of the boards. And the smoothing plane is about half the length-ish. It's a little short, but not a huge issue. What I'm wanting is a really nice smooth edge to glue together. And I could get out my big jointer, but my smoothing plane makes me happier. And as long as I keep a nice, clean, consistent pressure at the beginning here, I'm pushing down on the knob. And at the end, I'm pushing down here so I'm not rounding off either end. Keeping it nice and flat. Trying to get a consistent curl on both sides. And the nice thing about doing both of them side by side is if the plane tips one way or the other, it's not a problem because they both have the same angle on them. When you bring them back together, those angles match. You can need one more pass. There we go. Nice clean curl on both of these end to end. And we can test them and make sure this is what we want. Oh, ooh, that's pretty. Get a really nice clean joint all the way across there. That's about as nice as it gets. Now the next thing we need to do is we need to figure out how wide is the board going to be this way because I want to cut this off before I glue these together because we need to make a small strip here that will then turn into our divider that goes in the middle. I know a lot of people don't want the divider in the box, but I want to have a divider in this because it gives me a chance to show off dados. Um, so let us grab our tape measure once more. And once again, we're going to measure from inside to inside right on the top edge of that groove. And we are at a 7 and 3 eighths. Now this board inside will expand and contract, so we do need to make sure we have leeway in there. So seven and three eighths, um, and I have a full quarter and a full quarter, so that's gonna be seven and seven eighths. I wanna leave an eighth inch of expansion and contraction because right now this wood is about as dry as it's going to get at this time of the year. So this wood probably won't shrink anymore, but in the summer when it gets moist, it will want to expand. So I'm gonna wanna leave about an eighth inch of a gap. So if I'm at seven and seven eighths, I'm gonna to wanna to back that down to seven and three quarter. You just double check. Yes, seven and three quarter is what I want. So we're going to put a couple marks on here. And which side do I wanna keep? I don't think it really matters. 
which side I want to keep. I'm going to measure off of this side. So, seven and three quarters. And there's a bunch of different ways. If I trust that this board is perfectly parallel from this side to this side, which this one is, I could bring in my marking gauge and set it to whatever that mark is and mark us off. Or I could grab out my panel gauge and I can put these two together and I can mark from one end to the other. Or I could come out here and I can mark out seven and three quarter, mark out here seven and three quarter, and then put the board over here and strike a line. Um, but in this case, I know these boards are precisely the same thickness. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab my marking gauge and, wait, was that the line? Always good to double check. Three quarter, yep, that's the line. And I made that mark in there. I'm gonna put my pin right into that mark, slide the fence up against it, tighten it down, and then mark this on. And then this will give us our two panels. The small one then becomes the other half of the bottom. And then this one, then we'll take that off and make that the divider for the two. Now, if I were going to be shiplapping these, that difference would be slightly farther over. So this line would be slightly farther over and our divider wouldn't be quite as tall. Not a huge issue. Um, but next we need to rip this down. And ripping thinner stock is a bit of an issue. Oh, shoot. Wow, I did not think that through. What? I'm sorry, I was going to... Oh, yeah, I can do that. Okay, cool. Uh, so it's going to take me a second to set up my, uh, my saw bench. Any questions while I'm doing this? Yes, we've had several now. Okay, cool. So Kevin Lerma had asked earlier, why not use a curfing plane to help with this marking? Um, you know, a lot of people really, really like a curfing plane. And when I was first getting into hand tool woodworking, I made a curfing plane and I used it all the time when resawing. Oh, look at that hot woman over there. Um, and I have several videos on making a curfing plane. Um, I have, I think I made two different videos over the years. Uh, and I used it quite a bit. And it is helpful, but I find that it takes more time to make the kerf and then make the cut than it does just to make the cut. And so, why mess with the kerfing plane when I can just make the cut just as easily? Um, so yeah, I don't use a kerfing plane anymore. It's just, it's an extra step. Anytime I can eliminate a step, I, I like to. <laughs> so now, we can set this in here, and we can rip down. One of the nice things about thin material like this is it cuts really, really quickly. Start the cut. Okay, let me teach you that. I am getting rushing here, finding myself pushing. And what happens is I'm trying to push the cut to make it go faster. But occasionally if a tooth catches, the saw blade goes like this. And with thin stock like this is a chance to split the wood because there's nothing really holding it together. So I have to take the time, slow down. I hate taking the time. Don't I? I don't know. You like to do things the hard way. That's true. Thinking about keeping my arm in line with the saw, it's very important to make sure that this is all in line. Otherwise, you're going to be pushing the saw sideways, and that's going to be making things go out of curve. And then to finish it up, I'm going to sit on it, Let's see if I can start it this way. I'm going to do the crotch cut. Oh, I'm trying to move too fast today. Here. 
starting it that way is a pain. Let's start it this way. There. Now that we've started it, now we can do the crotch. Just know when to stop. I had to wait till you put the saw down. What questions we got while I'm setting this back up? Nothing. They're just bad influences. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, um, what? You ask me for a question and then you don't even let me. That's how I roll. I know. Can I ask my question? Yep, go for it. I double check my work. So Moon Wolf's going to ask, if your saw cut is off and not square, what do you do to fix it? Uh, if my saw cut is off when I'm resawing, um, you, though that's one of the great things about cutting two quarter inch pieces out of a three quarter inch board. You have a whole quarter inch of play one way or the other. Uh, if you're talking about cut is not square, I'm not sure what you're talking about. Uh, if you're talking about the original cut, that's why we left the board a little bit long so we can flush it up later after we glue it up. Because if these, this end from the factory is not square. Uh, so once I glue these up, I'm going to come back in with the, uh, with the low angle jack and I'm going to smooth these down. We'll do that uh, next week when we go and attach this in. What time is it? 36. Oh, we're doing great. Right, I don't need to be rushing. I've got plenty of time here. Okay, here I am out of breath thinking it's like five minutes left. That's because you always have to be 20 minutes early for everything. I don't know what you're talking about, babe. Oh, I'm supposed to <laughs> ask you if it's a right-handed saw. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's one of the great things about hand saws. There is no right or left to them unless they've specifically been carved that way. Um, yeah, work it both ways. Um, so the piece we cut off for the divider, um, Basically, all I'm going to do with that is I'm going to plane that down um, and make it smooth because we have one side that's smooth. The other side still has the saw curve, it is the, the, the saw marks on it. So I'm going to smooth that one down um, and then I'm going to bring it into parallel. So I've already drawn the parallel line on there. Now I just have to plane it down into that parallel line. Um, so I'm going to do that off camera during the week because I'm assuming smoothing a board out, most people can do that. Um, what we're looking for in this divider is we want it to be an even thickness all the way across, um, even dimension in both ways. That way we set it in the groove. If we cut a groove that's the same width all the way across, this will fit down into it. And whatever this thickness is, we will cut a groove to fit in there. Or um, what you can do is find whatever cutter you have for your plow plane and then make this to the same dimension that you have for your cutter. Which we'll be talking about that when we get to that. That'll be one of the last steps in the video. Um, so, uh, we got that, we got that, we got that. Cool, we're into this. Um, so now we have these two pieces together, we're going to glue them up. And there's a bunch of different ways of gluing them up. Because these are joined so nicely, uh, what we could do is put glue in there and just rub the two of them together until it seizes and set it aside like that and it'll work perfectly fine. Um, but I have a bunch of these bar clamps that I absolutely love. And so I'm going to be clamping mine up with these. Um, there's just something about these old wooden bar clamps that are incredibly enjoyable. Um, and I get asked all the time, where can I find the hardware for these? You can't. Um, they don't make them anymore. Well, there's one company I found in Germany. I've been trying to get a hold of them. And they're kind of similar. They fit into a slit in the board as opposed to wrapping around it. Um, and I, I'm trying to get a, a pair of those to play with. Um, but most of the time, the only place you can find these is antique auctions. Um, so that's what I'm going to do with mine. Glue it up and clamp it. Um, I don't think anyone really wants me to show them that on the live because it's, well, it's gluing it up, clamping it, and waiting. Um, I'm going to be using uh, Tight Bond 2. I don't know why anyone and, uh, wouldn't want to watch glue dry. Yeah. <laughs> um, the next thing I want to talk about is actually starting the bending. And what we want to do is we want to have a handle on this. Let me grab the other one. And we got this one. Hold on. We want to have a handle on here that's bent. Why did I design one with a bent handle? Well, I like the look of the bent handle. It's a nice shape to it. And wood bending is something that is 
kind of scary to some people. You may have noticed a, a motif to this. I'm trying to pick joints and methods that are a little bit scary um, to try and demystify them. So we're going to be building, bending this. Now one of the problems with wood bending is a lot of people think they need to make a steam box. And yeah, a steam box would be easier. A steam box is a lot better for something that's like three quarter inch. You could stick it in there and you know, 45 minutes later, it's steamed and ready to bend and you don't have to worry about it. But I don't want to build a steam box. What I have is a piece of four inch PVC like that. Um, and I have a cap on the end. And this one I actually got out of a dumpster a while ago and I've been using it for all sorts of different things. Um, I have another one which is somewhere down here uh, that's um, four foot long. Um, and so what I need is one that is long enough Oh, look at that, I can bend it. And I don't even need to soak the whole rod in there because we're going to be bending it. Put this over here. We're just gonna be bending it right here. So all I really need wet is like that much of the stick. So I only need about two feet worth of a PVC pipe to stick it in. And I don't even need to make it four inch PVC. I could make it out of two inch PVC. I could make it out of, I could probably work, make it out of, eh, I probably wouldn't want to do it out of one inch because it would take up too much water. Uh, but a two inch piece of PVC, two foot long, I can steam bath it in that. Um, and we're gonna be talking about that a little bit more, but just understand that's probably something you're gonna need is a piece of PVC with a cap on the end. And we will boil water. But the hardest part about bending wood isn't the bath you put it in or the steaming box it is the form you need to create to bend the wood. And, oh, I left it over there. I moved everything I needed for this just before the live. So I was playing with all sorts of different methods for this handle. Um, and I was trying different bending heights and I came up with this. And I really like this one because it is designed to work as a two by four. Um, do I have a, here's a one by four, same width. What you can do is we're going to be making this bending frame out of a simple two by four. And it's of the size that you can just use a two by four, um, a little over two foot long, and you can put in the pegs to make your own bending frame. It doesn't need to be something that has a perfectly smooth curve running all the way around it. It just has to be the points on which you want to bend it around. Ooh. Now, if you bought the plans, um, I have plans for that in, um, in the work. <sighs> Did I? Oh, it's over there too. <laughs> I have plans for the measurements on all of that. There it is. <laughs> My pine two by four. So you can lay this out yourself. And this is one of these things where you can take a little bit of practice Oh, there it is. I did have that up. And you can change the design a little bit. This is a fairly graceful, simple bend. It doesn't take that much to make. If you want to make it a little bit higher, all you're going to do is move your two pegs farther up. And my initial one, I had two pegs up here, but then I found that handle was just way too high. It looked weird sticking up. And so the one that I like was this size. It just happened to be about the right size that I could fit it into a two by four. And all I have is a one inch dowel and I'm going to cut it into three inch long segments. Um, so I'll have four three inch segments and then follow the plans which gives you center locations for where you drill your four holes. Pound in your pegs. I mean these aren't even, let's see if they're loose enough. No, not quite loose enough. They're not glued in place, they're just pounded into place. And now I have these pegs that I can bend against. Um, so my goal for our next visit is I want to actually do the bending of the handle because we want to do this ahead of time so that it has time to dry. So between now and then we need to make a form. So grab your plans, a chunk of two by four and a one inch dowel, cut it into three inch segments, drill four holes and pound your dowels in. That's really all it is. So I'm not going to do that live because it's drilling four holes and putting four dowels into it. Um, 
Yeah, pretty straightforward. Um, so make that pattern ahead of time. And then we have to get ready for the bath. So then we also need our tube that we're going to put it in. And between now and then, you need to take a three quarter inch dowel, um, get an oak dowel with really nice straight grain. I talked about that last time, how to look up um, how to find a dowel with straight grain. You're gonna have to dig through the stock if you go to the big box store. And you're gonna to wanna to soak the oak dowel in water in the tube for two days. Why two days? Because it takes a long time to get the water all the way into the wood. You can get it faster with a vacuum chamber, you can get it faster with steaming, um, but the easiest way is just soak the dowel in the wood for two days, and that will get it good and wet. And so next time we get together, um, we are gonna have this soaking ahead of time. And then what you do is you dump the water out of the tube, you fill it up with boiling water, and you put the wet, the wet stick back into the boiling hot water, let it sit for about 30 minutes or so, and then bend it, and that's it. Um, it's kind of one of those things that's a long run for a short slide, but once you actually bend it, it's like, oh, okay, it's done. And you let it sit in the bending frame for about two days and let the wood dry out. And once it's done, you've got a perfectly bent handle that's ready to work with this. Um, so next time we get together, we're actually going to be doing the boiling water, the soaking, and then the bending of it. Um, so in between now and then, you'll have to make the form and um, be soaking your stick for two days ahead of time. And then when we get together, we're going to do that. So hopefully uh, next time we're going to do the bending of that. We're going to have our bottom. I'm going to pull that out of the glue and we'll have that ready to go. So next time we're going to be taking the bottom, doing the finishing, getting it set in place, prepping out, uh, prepping out the divider, getting that ready to go, bending the frame, and this is all, all these little things. And then the last time we get together, we're going to be installing our divider and then actually installing the handle into the, into the box itself. Um, so this one is kind of like the, the catch-all. I really wanted to focus on the resawing, but preparing for the next time, getting ready to soak your bath and having your bending frame ready. Um, what questions we got? Okay, How much time on. do we have left? 46. Okay, good. I'm not hurrying too much. All right, let's see. Um... Dennis Miko asked, do, you need, do we need to build muscle memory for sawing? Um, yes and no. The, the, the hardest thing that people have with sawing is keeping their arm in line and getting their body out of the way. Once you do that, then it's focusing on not pushing the saw. Don't grab the saw handle. If you find your knuckles are getting white, you're grabbing the saw handle. The saw should be loose in your hand. It should be really almost floppy in your hand. You shouldn't have any force going down the saw. If you're putting any force of the teeth into the wood, you're going to cause that plate to bend inside of the cut. You want to let the weight of the saw do the work. Let the saw go, work, go back and forth. You're just providing the back and forth motion to it. Let it be loose in your hand and don't push it down. That's, that's the big thing to work about. And the muscle memory is just keeping your body out of the way and letting your hand do the work. Um, it is a little bit tricky for some people to keep that uh, hand in line with the arm, in line with the elbow, all the way up the shoulder, so this whole thing is moving at an even pace. Um, and one of the things with following a straight line with a saw is, it's one of these things, the only way to learn it is to do it. And you're gonna mess up. And you're going to veer off course from time to time. And that's okay. When you veer off course, don't try to bring the saw back on to course. Don't try and steer it back because then you're just going to go off the other way and then you're gonna zigzag zag back and forth and you're gonna end up with this cut that goes all over the place. When you find yourself going off course, back up, twist the saw in the cut and use the side of the teeth to file that line back to where it should be until you have a nice bottom set and then you can go back to cutting straight again. When you find yourself going off course, stop, Back up, straighten the cut. Don't try and steer it back in. That will cause you more problem than it's worth. And the best way to learn is to do it. Um, yes, having good body mechanic is incredibly important and the better your body mechanic is, the less your problems you're gonna have. But until you've spent the time doing it, it's one of these things that you're not gonna get any better at it. And I can talk about it all day long, um, but until you've put in hours of sawing, Saws are going to go off course. It's just the way things are.
So <laughs> you gotta try it. Be, don't be afraid to mess up. This is part of the game. You're gonna have fun. Enjoy it. Um, don't worry about messing up. It's 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 the fun part. Except for when you throw the board across the room and scare your kids. No, you didn't do that at all yesterday. I, I never do that. Mm -mm. Yesterday I had a glue up that went just. Oh, I wasted about four hours on that thing. It was not a happy time. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be talking about that in an upcoming He does video. occasionally lose his temperature. <laughs> I almost said temperature. <laughs> yeah, I lose my temperature from time to time. <laughs> What's next? Hang on. All right. Change the topic quickly. Jared A. Stone asked, are you going to make a panel clamp? Um, no, I don't like panel clamps. Um, they, they're a one-trick pony that... Uh, I just don't have much use for. I really like beam clamps. They store up out of the way. I can use them for a lot of different things. Um, and so I find panel clamps to be nice, but it really doesn't matter. Where, where panel clamps really come into play is when you want these boards to be perfectly lined up this way so that you have a really nice smooth surface. And for a hand tool woodworker, getting that perfectly smooth surface across the two boards really isn't that big a deal because if they're not perfectly smooth, I'll grab a hand plane and I'll just feather them out and make them smooth. Um, and it's a really quick and easy process. If you're a power tool woodworker and you've glued two boards together and they're not the same level, now they're too wide to fit through your planer. What do you do? And so for a power tool person, it is incredibly important that those two boards be perfectly lined up. Um, and that's one of the places where a panel clamp really shows up is you can get those really nice and clamped because you do have the, the calls coming across that hold them in place. Um, but for me, it's really not that big a deal, and so I don't want a, a big panel clamp here that fills up the shop. So, But everyone's different, so you might like it. Uh, let's see. Moonwolf asks, will the 3 8 inch join together hold a lot of weight, or do you have to watch the amount of tools you put in? <laughs> it will hold, um, it, yes, it will hold more, wood, more weight than the thickness of the wood can handle. Um, yeah, don't don't worry about that. It, even if this were down to like a full th a quarter inch, it would be stronger than it needs to be. The the glue will not fail. The wood will fail long before the glue fails. Um, so yeah, I, I could I could probably load this tote up with seventy five a hundred pounds worth of stuff, and not have a problem with it at all. Um, it's far stronger than it needs to be. So I mean, yes, if you in all honesty, a glue joint is probably the strongest joint to put in there um, because a tongue and groove, though it sounds good and it will keep them nice and level, all you're doing is you're making a whole bunch of really thin pieces of wood and those thin pieces of wood will break far easier. And so a tongue and groove joint will not last as long as just simple gluing it together. A half lap joint or a ship lap joint will not last as long as just simple gluing it together. That's the strongest joint you can get is just butt gluing them together because you are long grain to long grain and it will be far stronger than the wood itself. So, hope that answers your question. What's next? Okay, on a lighter note, Volunter Workshop asks, will you, will you find a decently priced router plane at the peach meet and guard it like a Black Knight style until I get there? <laughs> <laughs> Usually there are uh, four to six router planes around um, and you're going to find them in all different conditions. You'll find them with, you know, it needs a good bit of work. It comes with one cutter and you might get it for 35, 40 bucks. Um, and then you'll find other ones that have a cutter or two and are in a nice shape, ready to go for around 60 bucks. And then you'll find a couple in boxes that have everything and it's like a hundred bucks. Um, so they'll, there, there'll be several of them there. Let's see, Brian Mulligan, where do you source leather for your bench vice slash straps? Um, usually Amazon. Um, I, there is a uh, Tandy leather company that's in Milwaukee that if I'm going by that way, I'll stop by and pick some up. Uh, but usually I buy a whole hide, uh, full side of leather, and that'll last me a few years. Um, not just for vices, but for everything else. Uh, was he talking about straps or vice jaws? Both. Uh, that, that's for vice jaws. Uh, for straps, um, I use horsehide leather, um, and that is a very, very hard leather to come by. And I have like five or six different suppliers that I contact when I need to buy it. 
Um, and so, I mean, yeah, it's, it's difficult to find a, a regular consistent source for it. Um, and so I'll call up one or two and they're like, no, we don't have any in stock. And I'll call up another one like, hey, we have one side of it. And I was like, I'll take it. And then I'll call up another one and like, he has two or three more and I'll take those. Um, <laughs> so yeah, the horse hide for strops is a little bit harder to come by. Um, but uh, my regular saw, I, I just used a vegetable tan, simple leather, something around like a five ounce weight. And uh, it does really well. What's next? All right. I'm going to do two others and then go back to this one question because it was a bigger question. So Punisher Woodworking asks, can you bend the wood, um, I'm assuming from a freshly, oh, can you bend wood that is freshly cut from a tree? Um, yes, but you'll want to boil it first. Um, in other words, if the wood was freshly cut and it's green and wet, can you just bend that? Probably not, um, it, because it's not just the moisture, it's the heat as well. The heat allows the water molecules to be moving around more and it will, will bounce things around. Um, because when you're bending the wood, you're not actually bending the wood. What you're doing is you're crushing the fibers on the inside of the curve. All those fibers on the inside are squeezing down. The top expands a little bit, but not much. Everything on the inside of the curve is being crushed down into surface. And so if that wood is not hot, um, it just binds up and splinters past each other. But if it's hot and it's fully soaked, then it is fairly uh, moldable and works really well. Um, so that's why you need to, uh, you need to heat it up. Um, but if it's green, then theoretically you should just be able to put it straight into the boiling water 30 minutes later, bend it. Um, but that's basically what we're doing with soaking it overnight uh, for two days ahead of time is we're filling it up with water and we're basically turning it back into green wood. So hope that answers your question. Right. So Greg Cheng asked, is it possible to resaw with a cheap big box store saw? Yes, yes. And I was thinking about doing that. I have a, a DeWalt saw that I got and it's, uh, that'll actually be in Saturday's video. I'm doing a project with a cheap box DeWalt saw, um, you know, hand saw. It, I was planning on going getting a cheaper one, but the only one at the store was the DeWalt one. I was like, oh, okay, well, I'll buy the DeWalt one. Um, and then I have a, a, a cheap set of carving knives that I got on Amazon. And so we're doing a project with really basic tools. Um, but yes, you can resaw. The problem with those is most of the saws you get from the big box store are um, their cross cut teeth. And so they tend to wander a little bit more in the cut than a, than a rip saw. Um, and so because of that, you just have to be a little bit more careful and be a little bit slower with your cut to cut down. Um, so rip saw teeth will work better, but you're not gonna find rip teeth at a, uh, at a box store. So yeah. But yes, you can do it with that. And I actually did um, the, which project was it? It was, oh, my, my coffee table. Um, when I was making that, um, I resawed the bottom for the drawer on that. And that was a 12 inch wide board. And I did that with a, with a saw I got at the box store. Can be done, just takes a little more time and practice. All right, this is the last question, but there's like two questions in it, so I hope they make sense cool. to you. Cool. So Kevin Lerma asked, being the sides of the main project are at an angle, that would mean the width of the bottom would be longer on top on the top of the dado in comparison to the bottom of the dado, correct? Um, well, okay, couple things in that. Um, number one, if it goes, if the groove goes with the grain, it's a groove. If it goes across the grain, it's a dado. Um, so this is, it's a groove. Um, small semantics, but it makes a few importances later on when we're actually going to be cutting a dado that meets with a groove. Um, so I just wanted to get that out of there. Um, uh, well, here, let me pull, let me pull this apart. Uh, uh, yeah, here, we can do it from the end. So. Focus, and then there we go. Switch over to two. So what he's talking about is the gro the grooves on the end of this, and thankfully they are available. Why don't you switch? There we go. We can see them on the end here, and what we have is the groove here and here. Let me show you on this end. I think I can see. Yeah, I can see a little better on this end. Uh, we have 
the groove sticking out here, and it's a slightly longer distance from this point here to the end of the groove, and it's a shorter distance up here from this point here to the end of the groove. So one of the nice things about having open here is I could just bring out the tape measure and I can put it right on here, put the one inch right on there, and I can say, oh my, that is eight and three quarter inches, just like I thought. Uh, excuse me, seven and three quarter inches. Um, no, seven and seven eighths is what I said, and then we get, we're taking the eighth inch off. So we can measure it on the outside here, but what I was doing is measuring the inside point, which is right here to right here, and then adding on the quarter inch here. I knew I cut this groove in a quarter inch. From this point here, it's one quarter inch in. And from this point here, it's like, what, a quarter inch and a sixteenth? Um, I hate the English system. Why can't we just become metric? <laughs> so yes, there is a difference because the the groove is parallel with the bottom, not parallel with the angle of the board. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, if not, send me an email. I'll send some pictures. All right, so the second half of his question was, when you measured, did you measure at the top or the bottom of the groove? Um, I measured at the top of the groove because I know I cut in a quarter inch measuring from the top of the groove. Um, and so that way I know I'm a quarter inch deep at that point. Um, but one of the nice things, I, I, I wish I'd thought about that when I was actually doing the measuring, is if you left these holes in the end, you still have the measurements out here. So you can just take your tape measure out and measure right across there and know exactly what your width is. And if you are in your dry season, you're going to want to make it an eighth inch smaller than your groove space. If you are in your wet season, and you're about as wet as you're possibly going to be during the year, then you're probably going to want to take it really close to maximum size so that it will shrink an eighth inch during the dry season. Um, so just keep okay. that in mind. So poor man just said, can you use, have James use the other side since your box covered whatever you were just pointing to towards where my box is on the screen? Oh, see. sorry. Here, let me show you that again. I can't see that on my end. Let's see. Okay, so there we go. Let's, here, let's do this. Go down here, focus on that. So what we've got here is our measurement. Take measures over here. It is from there to there. So there is a difference on the top of this groove to the end of the groove. Here, let me actually zoom in a little bit more. I'll show you what I'm talking about even closer. There, that's about as close as I can get. So what we've got here is there is a measurement difference from the top of the groove to the end of the groove is a shorter distance than from the bottom of the groove to the end of the groove. So when you're measuring, I measured from this corner here to the corresponding measurement on the other side. And I knew from this corner here to this corner here is one quarter inch. From this corner to this corner it's slightly longer than a quarter inch. Um, so that was just what I knew that when I cut this, I cut it a quarter inch deep from here to here. But the nice thing about this particular setup is because both of these grooves are open on the end, I could just grab out my tape measure and measure, oh look, it's seven and seven eighths from uh, edge of groove to edge of groove. So hope that makes it simpler. Um, where are we at? One. Any other? Nope, that took us up. Three cool. Questions. Well, I think we are good on time. So um, next week we will be getting to fitting the bottom into this um, as well as doing the bending. So get ready for that. If you want to bend along with me, then uh, make up your form according to the pattern. Drill four holes, put four pegs into it. Woo ya! <laughs> and then soak your three quarter inch dowel uh, for at least two days beforehand. And then we will do the bending on that. So. Ooh, I've got to remember to do that when I get back because I will be in uh, Georgia on Saturday. I'll be coming back on Saturday. So I have to remember on Sunday, I have to start soaking my dowel so it's ready for the live. So remind me of that. So everybody set a reminder. Everyone send me a message on Sunday. <laughs> I need to soak my dowel so we're ready for the live on Tuesday. <laughs> and we'll be bending it live and hopefully it snaps. Um, a small bend like this, it's, it's pretty rare that it snaps, but if it isn't perfectly straight grain, who knows? We'll see. So I think that'll about do it for today. And until next time, 
Have a wonderful day. Oh, I'm not even ready. Oh, well, I can stand here and hold this like I'm not doing anything. <laughs> All right, bye. It's normal.